morning, Dr. Langer. Hey guys, how you doing? What's up? I've been waiting to get on this thing this week and uh, it's great to see uh, so many um, students back from um, the last few years. I, hope so. I don't know how many of you are new, how many are old, uh, but um, it's a uh, always a pleasure to do this and um, I'm excited. So um, today I thought that uh, we would uh, re do, a, do some vascular. That's what I was asked to do, uh, do a cerebrovascular OR, which is um, near and dear to my heart and show some vascular cases, uh, which are really, uh, you know, vascular neurosurgery is a, a field. I think it's the greatest field in the world. Um, I can't imagine doing anything else. You know, unfortunately, because of catheters and the types of things we can do with catheters now, the number of open surgical cases we're doing is diminishing, um, which is unfortunate. But uh, nonetheless, open vascular remains are just absolutely amazing experience. Uh, and especially with the operating exoscope, the exoscope is a new platform of operating that I think is uh, a tremendous uh, tool. And so what I'm gonna do is show you portions of different talks that I put together over the years and sort of schmeye around in lots of different talks and find some good cases to show you. Um, in the meantime, before I go do anything, are there any, uh, you know, instead of waiting for questions at the end, I always, uh, we always run out of time so I can uh, answer some quick questions now. If, um, if y'all have uh, interest in asking some questions, I don't know who, uh, if the, I know the, pan the our, our, our other panelist is here, so I'm happy to do that. If not, we can go ahead. All right, let's just go ahead. So let me share my screen. Somebody said, what is the scope of neurosurgery? It, um, I mean, I think the scope in general, it, it, neurosurgery is everything from little babies, even there's each intrauterine neurosurgery. There's uh, uh, where we actually open the uterus in, in a pregnant woman and fix uh, a problem called uh, myelomeningocele. And so neurosurgeons can start actually in the womb and extends all the way to the elderly. I've operated on people up to in their, in their 90s. For usually those people have uh, uh, degenerative processes like normal pressure hydrocephalus, which is a pro problem where people have difficulty absorbing their spinal fluid as you get older and they need a shunt. So it spans all age groups and there's pediatric neurosurgery all the way up to adults. And then there are really five subspecialties, vascular, functional, which is really the, probably the most rapidly growing uh, subspecialty, which involves um, uh, brain stimulation, computer brain interface, a uh, brain a body computer interface where you're, we're getting electrodes that are, that are, are bad bypass the spinal cord, for example, for people's spinal cord injury and functional neurosurgery. So it's a tremendous field. It's very computer driven, uh, spine uh, neurosurgery, which is, uh, anything I'm going to do with a spine. Um, and then you have, um, uh, a P uh, we said pediatric vascular spine functional, um, and, uh, cancer and tumor. So those are the big, uh, the big um, subspecialties in neurosurgery. I'm personally a love open vascular, which is a, maybe a shrinking subspecialty, but we do a fair amount nonetheless here. Um, someone asked, what is my day like? How often the OR versus patient? I've been doing more administrative as I've gotten older. I'm 59, which isn't really that old. I don't think myself as old, but I think one of my motivations now is to uh, be a mentor and, and, and get my junior attendings uh, to be better than me at what they do. Um, it's, I think it's important that I leave here uh, with, a, with a group behind me that um, is super talented and extends my career because I can't operate forever at, this, at the rate that I do. So uh, making this effort um, ensures that I have a role because once you are, uh, have surround yourself with great people, you become an essential part of a team. And I think that's really the the, the greatest aspect of my life, honestly, now I have just a wonderful job because I get to operate sometimes. I get to support my junior faculty and operate with them. And I get to do some administrative work and think. You know, it's, it's also really important to take time and slow down sometimes and just think um, because um, uh, if you're always running around, you don't give your brain a, a chance just to uh, rest. And to um, that's often when your best ideas come up. Uh, take a walk. I mean, I, I'm, I'm 
I'm very, I love taking a walk every day. That's something a lot of very successful people have done. And in fact, the whole idea of brain turns came up just thinking in my office one day about three years ago, uh, because uh, my, my son uh, was lost his internship for the summer because of COVID. Um, and I just, we were just thinking, sitting around and, and just thinking, and look what that wrought. You know, and now we're affecting, we have over 200 people on this, on this, uh, pod, on this uh, webinar today. We used to have thousands during COVID. So, you know, I think that that's the um, key um, to success. It's, it's giving yourself a chance to stop and think and, and, and take that walk. IR um, interventional neuroradiology is, is a, it's really a subspecialty of, of vascular neurosurgery. Um, it spans both neurology, radiology, and neurosurgery. It's a, I, I train in, in neurointerventional. It's a great subspecialty. Uh, it's all catheter-based. So you're looking in, your, in, in a biplane x-ray room. I can show you what that looks like. Um, but it's, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't appeal to me as much visually um, as the open operations because you're operating using x-rays. You're not looking directly at the, at the tissue itself. And there's something just so almost supernatural about looking at neurosurgery, um, which I will definitely show you. Uh, books. Uh, I could give you a long list, um, but to start, I would read all of Ryan Holiday's books. Um, he is a, without question, has had the biggest impact on me personally, um, and he, or ego is the enemy is a great place to start. Uh, courage is the cure and obstacles are, co obstacle is the way, the obstacle is the way. These are three books that have uh, deeply impacted me and my life. Um, and I would, I would start there and read those three and then we'll talk, come back and ask me for more. Um, I also like biographies. Uh, Steve Jobs biography by Walter Isaacson is great. I liked Elon Musk's biography, which is, I don't remember the author, um, as well as uh, the op, uh, a book called um, Pro, uh, American Prometheus, which is about J. Robert Oppenheimer, who, who's one of my heroes, who ran the Manhattan Project and the, and the nuclear project. So though, those are the uh, three biographies I'd recommend and uh, just off the top of my head. Um, uh, and not just want to appreciate this and the, the Netflix. <laughs> yeah, the Netflix show is great. I, it, it opened up... Uh, a lot of doors to all of us and uh, has allowed Lenox Hill neurosurgery to be impactful, which in a way that we never could have been. I mean, uh, the reason why uh, we were able to stand up brain turns to so many people is because you heard about us in social and, and you saw the Netflix show. And we knew that would happen once the, co when, once the pandemic came in, we knew that the Netflix show was coming out and we knew we'd have a lot of eyeballs on it. We knew how, what a spectacular representation of healthcare in a small, New York hospital would be, and whether it was obstetrics or neurosurgery or ER, I think that the representative doctors that were in it uh, really represent the best of American healthcare and healthcare, you know, at large. So I hope it um, opened your eyes to what's what you're capable of doing and what, um, what the potential is being a physician. Uh, we need the best and brightest people uh, to go and to be doctors um, and nurses for that matter. Um, or physician assistants. And I think that um, right now, uh, there's a lot, a lot of options and opportunities and we have to ensure despite some pressure from bureaucracy and from money that we still consider healthcare because it's still the most wonderful thing you could do with your life if you're cut out for it, there's nothing better. So um, that was the purpose of doing the Netflix show in the first place. And um, I think that uh, it, it, it bear fruit and that we could use it to get access to all you guys. I don't think you'd all be here, probably not nearly as many. If it wasn't for that show, we certainly wouldn't have had the thousands of students in the last two summers uh, that we uh, helped to teach and educate. And it's been a, an honest, honest, you know, a humbling privilege to be able to do this and uh, continue to do it. And so I really appreciate not only uh, what uh, you guys are doing, but certainly what Dr. D'Amico and his team have done to make this happen. So they deserve a huge amount of uh, congratulations. Make sure you thank Randy every single day because he really is the uh, engine behind uh, this program. Um, the best advice uh, for undergrads, pre-med advice, you know, I, I think you've got to work hard. <laughs> That's it. You know, do good work, do the right thing, be honest, be humble, find a good mentor. You know, that, that's pretty much uh, standard. Uh, don't do what everybody else does. You know, follow your own path, keep your eyes on the boat, focus on what you're good at, and uh, 
and things will work out in general. You know, I think if you really want to be a doctor, find someone in your university or in, the, in a local university that you can work with. Most uh, mentors are open and honest and are willing to take students on. Certainly shadowing is a great thing. The trouble with shadowing is it's really for you. It's one way, but you have to come out of, of that experience with something substantive, research, a paper. You know, those are really important as you apply to medical school. Take a year out if you can. Uh, don't, there's no rush. Um, I think there's this tendency to try to get everything done. You're never really done. You're educating yourself for the rest of your life. Take the extra year, spend it doing something substantive. You'll be a better medical school applicant um, for sure, you know, without question. And so th that would be my best advice. Uh, yeah, I see the other docs uh, frequently. John Bookfar is my, like one of my best friends and my partner. I see Miritha from time to time. Unfortunately, Amanda is in the West Coast and we don't see her as often. She no longer works at Lenox Hill because she was a resident when she was on the show. Um, I think if I had a choice, there's no question, MD uh, is way more valuable than being a DO. Uh, it's not that you can't be a good doctor as a DO, but it does close some doors. And I do think the research and the type of teacher and the intensity of the education is superior as an MD. It doesn't mean that people aren't great who are DOs. There are some great, really talented people that go to DO school and come out as great doctors. But to get access to the best research, to get back access to the most resource, to get access to the best teachers uh, in the most sophisticated fields, it requires an MD. And it's very difficult with the DO to access the University of Pennsylvania's and the Harvard's of the world where you know, probably the best of the research and the environments, the best for teaching. So that's just the way it is. Because ultimately, no matter how smart you are, you still have to be surrounded by smart people who are as ambitious or more ambitious than you, as you, as your mentors, your teachers. And so that doesn't, that's way more common in an MD environment. Um, the biggest challenges are probably uh, the bureaucracy and the um, fact that hospitals these days are more than hospitals, they're healthcare companies. Uh, and so they're focused on, on their profits or their profit margins, or at least make enough money to continue to move. And um, that unfortunately brings a significant amount of stress and pressure on physicians to operate or do cases. And that can become perverse that sometimes the incentive to operate and do more cases moves into ethics and what the right thing to do is. And these kind of stresses and friction points are what I think uh, we have to deal with as physicians. And the key is to keep your, keep your compass straight, be humble and kind, and uh, always be, do, be honest and do the right thing. Um, and that can be increasingly difficult because of you get your what are called KPIs or key performance indices every month to see people keep track of how many cases you're doing. And if you don't do cases within a budget, some uh, an administrator might come in and, 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 and ask you, you know, what's going on and how do we increase volume and this kind of thing. And it's not easy to do. I think my feeling is the best way to increase volume is just to be great at what you do and let everybody know. And that's what we're doing. That's, that's my strategy. It's like have the best team in the world around you, make sure they're really successful and then market the crap out of it, you know? And that way you're ethical and honest and humble and yet you tell everybody what's going on at Lenox Hill Neurosurgery. So tell everybody, tell your parents, this is the best place on earth because it is, and that's how you do it. And we, then we keep the volume up because everybody comes to us for their surgery and I don't, I don't have to worry about it. So that's, I think the, the way I, I approach the problem. Um, Americans can access healthcare very easily. Just go to an emergency room and someone will take care of you for free. No question about it. Uh, the, the, the biggest uh, understatement is it's very hard. It's much harder here to get elective things done like an orthopedic procedure for free or some that's more quality of life. But the same thing happens in socialist environments or where healthcare is free or the single payer or whatever. Go to Canada, you'll see long lines for basic spine surgery that doesn't exist in the United States. The United States still remains the best healthcare system, I think, but it also is the weakest in some way. But just for straight on getting good care, I think the U.S., if you choose carefully, people get what they need. I'm not saying it's the most efficient. I'm not saying it's the, not the most costly. And European and Canadian healthcare has huge advantages and British healthcare for that matter. But the U.S. healthcare is really still 
I think, uh, leading the way in most in research and in innovation and in treating the most difficult problems. It all happens here in the US first. Um, changing the health system, I hope, will happen. I'm not going to hope because they're not going to happen. So there's no reason to hope. It's only going to get worse, I think. Doctors are going to be paid less. The bureaucracy is going to increase. But you know what? The technology continues to get better. We continue to do great things. No, you're not going to make as much money. I've done really well, and I'm never going to apologize for that. It's going to be harder to make the money that I'm making for your generation in healthcare. And that's, I'm not going to apologize for that, just, just the way it is. Um, let's see. Da, da, da. Good morning. This isn't a question. I read your article about your ski accident. Yeah, my ski accident was something else. Um, I think it was uh, the most significant experience that I've had um, without question. I, uh, I'm, I'm actually really grateful uh, that it happened to me actually um, because it, um, it exposed me to, a, a, I gave up on living a normal life and um, uh, stopped for a few hours and thought through what I'd been through and accepted what I'd accomplished. So I was able to uh, almost have like a near death experience where I was a, as a father, as a, as, a, as, a, as a husband and as a doctor. And I, I got there and then I came back. So uh, to have had that experience, it's, it's a, a, a revolutionary thing for me and um, very grateful to have had that experience. And I'm writing about it, I've written about it and I likely am gonna write a book about how it's impacted me in my life in a, in a, in a, in a way, because I, I've been interested in Stoic philosophy on top of that even before I got hurt and it, it connected a lot of dots for me. And so, um, I think these are, I'm not telling anybody should break your neck, but hopefully you can learn a little bit from what I went through to, to as you move through your careers. And uh, I'm, I'm hope, hopefully that, that's why I wrote that and hopefully it'll happen. Um, international students, um, neurology is pretty easy, I think. Uh, it's probably the easiest uh, field, one of the easier because we need neurologists in the US. So neurology residencies in general take foreign students. And so I'd encourage you to come visit uh, and uh, the key to getting here is to come over for your research or, or shadowing or what have you and impress a neurologist. And you can, I think it's not difficult to get a neurology residency as a foreign, it may not be the most, you know, competitive one, but certainly it's neurosurgery is very different. Neurosurgery is much more competitive and a lot harder. Uh, MD, PhD, um, it helps as a neurosurgeon, I, I think. Um, I think the stresses on neurosurgeons are gonna be increasingly bureaucratic. I personally did some great research as an undergrad and as a medical student, and I wish that continued it. Um, however, I think the most impactful research is done by researchers. And unless you are in a super environment with just like ridiculous resource and great mentorship, it's gonna be hard to be a great neurosurgeon and a great researcher given the competitive environment. That's just the way it is. They're two unique fields, two unique skill sets. One doesn't necessarily feed over the other. If I was starting all over, I'd probably get an MBA and, and become more of, uh, be more conversant, more comfortable with uh, bureaucratic and administrative tools. I think that's what I would do. Um, that doesn't mean you should do that. If you're really science driven and uh, want to, you know, continue basic research or some sort of, you know, animal research, even clinical research, that works very well too. But I, I still think in this day and age that the biggest impact is physicians we made by MD MBAs going forward um, and um, would encourage really smart kids to do that. Um, a DO student cannot be as, a, as competitive by definition, but it doesn't mean you can't match. It just means you have to work really hard, even harder and overcome those obstacles uh, and find ways to around the system. It's, a, it's unfortunately a scarlet letter. I don't think it's appropriate because I think some DO students are just as good it's, but it's a threshold. It's like an SAT score. If you don't get a certain threshold of SAT or ACT, some colleges won't look at you. If you don't have an MD, some program, the best programs simply aren't going to look at you in the most competitive fields. That's just the way it goes. And it's not fair, but it is what it is. Um, I've answered these questions. Brain transplant like or body transplant, same thing. Unlikely to happen. The spinal cord is the problem, not the brain. We can, we can re-vascularize uh, the brain and keep the brain alive, but the spinal cord is the problem. And so we solve a spinal cord injury, we won't be able to do a brain transplant. Um, 
oh, brain transplant for hemispherectomy. It's possible with stem cells. That's not crazy, uh, but it's probably will happen way before we get a brain transplant. So I'm going to, with the last, uh, we have for 40 minutes, I think the questions are sort of a little bit repetitive. Um, so why don't I show a case? Is that something you all want to do? I'll look at the chat. This is an op this is a, a vascular conference. Okay, so let's take a look. I'm going to show you a rather complicated case. It's not necessarily a neurosurgery case. It's really a combination of neurosurgery and, and vascular. And so uh, why don't I show that off? Because I really love this case. Um, so this is a... Um, a, uh, a sophisticated case for this audience, but let's try. This is a 68-year-old uh, male who has symptomatic what's called vertebral basilar insufficiency. Um, hold on, let me just, I'm gonna do it this way so I can use my pointer. He has a symptomatic vertebral basilar insufficiency, which is means that the back of his brain isn't getting enough blood flow. The, the brain stem, the, the bottom of the brain, the, the sort of carburetor of the brain, the parts that keeps us awake. Uh, the brainstem is really responsible for wakefulness for, and some things like swallow, although the, the structures of swallowing are there, but our temperature regulation, just the ability to be alive is in the brainstem. You know, if you have a cortical injury up here, you might have a stroke that injures your motor function, but you're still awake and talking, uh, especially on the right side. But uh, if you lose your brainstem, you're essentially dead. And so when you get vertebral basilar insufficiency, this is a, a problem. This, this particular patient had trouble staying awake. He had dysarthria, means his speech was thickened and raw, like his words may come out. That's kind of what dysarthria sounds like, trouble swallowing. And the left vertebral artery, there are four arteries that go to the brain. The two vertebrals, they're paired in the back. They go up through the back of the spine into the back of the uh, brain case and the internal carotid arteries, which go more anteriorly up into the anterior circulation. So there are four vessels. There are two, these two vertebral arteries feed the brainstem into what's called, they, they fuse into what's called the basilar artery. And you can look this up in anatomy and I'll show you what that looks like. So the basilar artery is the artery of tar the target artery. So if you have an occlusion of one or both, you can really lose flow in that basilar artery and that progressive loss of flow in the basilar artery is what causes dysfunction of the brainstem. You may not have a stroke, but you can lose, start losing function but by not having enough blood flow. In addition to the brainstem, those same vessels, the basilar feeds what are called the posterior cerebral arteries, which feed the back of the brain, the visual cortex, the occipital cortex is fed by the posterior cerebral arteries. So people with disease of the vertebral arteries can present with VBI or vertebral basilar insufficiency, but also can have strokes or difficulty with their vision in the visual area. So this gentleman left vertebral artery was abnormal. It was functionally uh, abnormal. Um, it's not that it's, it's, it's not that it's disease, the, which is the way his anatomy was. Unfortunately, his left vertebral ended in the functionally means not enough, no real blood flow is going from the vertebral artery to the brain in the posterior inferior cerebellar artery, which is a small vessel that basically fields, feeds the bottom of the cerebellum. And when the, when the left vertebral artery ends in pica, the basilar artery then feeds off the right vertebral artery exclusively. So if you were born with a left vertebral artery that doesn't go to your brain and it goes to pica, then essentially all the blood flow that the brainstem needs more or less is going to come off the right vertebral artery. There are exceptions uh, to every rule, but let's just accept that. I'm going to let's keep it simple. And unfortunately in this 68 year old male, probably from a lifetime of smoking or not eating well, or simply not taking care of himself, he started to get atherosclerotic disease. So the same disease that can give you arterial obstructions of your heart that gives you heart attack, can affect the vertebral arteries or any artery in the brain and cause atherosclerotic disease and block one of the brain arteries. And in his case, the right vertebral artery was occluded at its origin. The right vertebral artery emanates from the right subclavian artery in the, in the shoulder. The subclavian artery or the, actually comes off the anonymate on the right side. The anonymate artery 
comes off and then branches into the subclavian. And one of the branches is the vertebral. And the vertebral artery normally feeds the brain from that right side of this patient. But unfortunately, due to it being occluded, uh, he lost a significant amount of blood flow in the vertebral bowser circulation, which gave him these deficits. Now, luckily for him and for me, because it gave me a great case to do, uh, the, the artery itself, although it was occluded, recanalized, meaning little tiny arteries. It's like if I had, if I want to go from New York to Philadelphia, if, for those of you international, I'm sorry for the reference, but New York to Philadelphia, I could take the New Jersey Turnpike, which is a big, it's 95 is the big interstate highway that runs from New York to Philadelphia. If I, if there was a giant accident on the New Jersey Turnpike, on the, on the New Jersey Turnpike, there'd be a huge amount of traffic to get to New, from New York to Philadelphia, but you could still find a way through the back roads and through the, new, through the Garden State Parkway and then get off here and then turn there. And you could still get to Philadelphia. It would take you longer and it would be more difficult, but you could get there. It's the same thing. If you occlude the right vertebral, as long as it was open somewhere else, these little back vessels can feed in and we can still get to the New Jersey Turnpike. We just have to go around the accident. And that's what happened with him. His vertebral artery, while it was occluded at, the, at its origin, there are all these little back road channels allowed it to be open right here at the skull base. It's between what's called C1 and C2. Uh, that that um, looks something like this. This is the back of the skull. Here are the two vertebral arteries as they track through the spine. You can see that here. Here's one vertebral, the left vertebral artery. Here's the right vertebral artery. And these are way long after they've left their origin. So if you're talking about the right vertebral artery over here, way down here, it's branching off like down here, down off the subclavian that comes up, but it was occluded down here. Yet these little branches kept it open right here. And if you look very carefully right there, that artery is the vertebral artery between C1 and C2. This is the C1 uh, uh, lateral mass or transverse process which I'll show you in the operating room. Then there's space between those two vessels, between C1 and then what's called the transverse process of C2. And if you look closely, that vertebral artery runs through a hole there. It runs through the C2, there's like a little hole where the vert travels right between C2 and C1. You see the whole C1. So this becomes a target. The reason why it's a target, if the, if the vertebral is occluded down here and it's open here, I can give more blood for the brain by doing an operation that connects the carotid artery, which is in the front up here, to this area of the vertebral artery that's open right here. And that's what we decided to do. And I'll show you how. Does that sound cool? I'll look at the chat. I think it's super cool. I think you can't even make this up. This is the coolest operation you can do. And I have 30 minutes now to spend some time to show it to y'all. So. Let's look at the case. So this is the uh, this is the um, MRI of the patient that uh, um, uh, existed back in December of 2010. It's called DWI, which is diffusion weighted image. This basically uh, tells us that whether well, new strokes. And as we play this. <laughs> Let me see how best way to do this. I'm trying to. Okay. So as we play this, you can see little strokes here. Right here. So there's a stroke in the brainstem. Here's the brainstem. You saw the rest of the brain. This is sort of the sinuses in the front. We're really looking at the cerebellum. This is the cerebellar peduncle. You can also see little strokes in the occipital cortex. This is the visual area. So this is back in December of 2020. He had those strokes. There's one in the cerebellum there. Now in April, he has a new stroke now. We gave him medical therapy between December and April. So four months later, in April of 2021, 20, right smack dab at the end of COVID, um, or that was in the middle of COVID, right? No, that was at the smack dab at the end of COVID, toward the end. He has a new stroke in the left occipital lobe, despite medical therapy. We always give these patients medical therapy, which is 
uh, anti-platelet drugs and are called statins, which are cholesterol lowering medication. But you can see that stroke back here that he had. So we decided he's really failing medical therapy. And what you can see, this is an MRA, an MR that looks just the blood vessels, MR arteriogram. Here's the left internal carotid artery coming up, filling the left hemisphere. Here's the right um, internal carotid artery coming up, filling the right hemisphere. Here's the left vertebral artery. See how it doesn't continue on in the basilar? It's cut off because it's feeding just pica, which we mentioned before. And here's the right vertebral artery looking very large. However, if you do look at this, there's something funny about it. It looks kind of normal as the shape and size. But if you look at the brightness of the vessel, it has less what's called flow-related enhancement. These are images, the brighter the vessel, the higher the flow. And we can use flow-related enhancement in a way to measure the flow. So we do a thing called NOVA. And what NOVA study does, it actually measures the flow in the, going to the brain. And there's data that if the basilar flow is less than 80, or the posterior cerebral flows are less than 40 each, that it, it's representative of significant vertebral basilar insufficiency. Meaning when we have those numbers, we know the patient is super sick and needs to be revascularized if possible. Revascularization means get more blood for the brain. And uh, what we see here is each vertebral artery offered only about, this one earned about 50 cc's. This is all from the recanalized. It wasn't, it was occluded down at its origin. Here's showing sort of the, you know, in a schematic, sort of the origin of the vertebral. And with, with collateralized collateralization, it reopened and was providing 49 cc's. The left vertebral artery, although it's ending in pica, are at 41. And that basically explains basically the majority of the blood flow and the rest of the brain. So here is the um, angiogram. What you see here, this is a, a subclavian injection. You can see the bottom of the skull or the chin here is the neck. The shoulders are about here. Here's the clavicle on the left, clavicle on the right. So you get an idea of where this is anatomically. This is the subclavian artery, and right here is a stump. That is, the, that is the vertebral artery origin. It's occluded. And as we run this through, watch what happens. What you're seeing is the occlusion sort of just, the, the blood sort of just pools there. It's like an eddy current because it doesn't go anywhere. But this here is the, bat, is the vertebral artery. Again, this artery is this part right here. What you're seeing is this part of the artery open, you're not seeing the bone so much. Uh, this is, there's bone all the way up here as it's traveling through the spine. You can see some spinal transverse processes on the other side. But right here, this, this area is that area I pointed out between C1 and C2, right here. You got that? So that's the area that we're seeing. So once we see this part, this anatomy, that the artery is open there, we have a target. And so we can basically use that target and bring blood flow to the brain extracranially. I mean, we can give, uh, we can revascularize the brain by opening up vessels down here. We do this all the time with carotid disease. Sometimes people have really severe narrowing of the carotid artery. We do what's called a carotid end arterectomy. We open up the carotid artery to bring more blood flow to the brain. Well, in this case, we're actually going to do a transplant. We're going to take a vein from the leg, attach it to the external carotid artery in the neck, the external, because it's safer than, than attaching to the internal carotid artery because you have to cut off blood flow to the brain temporarily while you did the bypass. But we're going to plan on going to the external carotid artery and jumping that up to this segment of the vertebral artery. Got that? Somebody tell me you got that in the chat. All right, Sam, Axel, you get the, you get the uh, prize today. Keep running through. Again, you can see the vertebral artery is almost normal. It's nice and smooth and open. And it's going up to the brain, but it's all coming from these little back pathways. Here's the accident, New Jersey Turnpike, right down here. And these are all the back ways getting back around the, the turnpike. Somebody asked if it's an endovascular solution. The trouble is if you shove a catheter up through that occlusion, you can dislodge clot and send the clot into the brain. There's no way to protect the brain. And so it's very, very dangerous to reopen that occlusion. People have tried especially people who really can't do this kind of operation. And there's a huge risk of stroke by doing that. And so the answer is no, I wouldn't do it that way. In the Atlantic Hill neurosurgery, we wouldn't do it that way. 
you can see, look, there's stagnation of contrast because this doesn't has nowhere to go in there. Now this looking from the right side, you can see here that this is the view from the side like this. We're seeing the back of the skull here, right here. And this is the artery coming down and here's our target. So here's the artery coming down and right there is that target artery again, right here. So we know we can access it. Quality of life hopefully is good. Hopefully we're gonna preserve his quality of life. That's really the goal. This is the contralateral vertebral artery. This is the left. This is ending in pica. This is the pica artery. You can see a little tiny twig going, getting through. Uh, this is actually the internal and external carotid artery on the left, but there's a similar one on the right. You can see the relationship between these vessels, at least on a lateral projection and the vertebral. They're not that far apart. The reason why an end arterectomy wouldn't work, we, it's very hard to do an end arterectomy of the vertebral artery um, at that level. And it's a very diseased vessel. And again, you're opening up a closed artery. And so you're, it's very hard to keep it open. Once it closes, it's the internal alumina and the endothelium die. And so that portion is very sick and diseased and really hard to keep it open. So you can see this vertebral artery was providing very little blood for the brain above the pica, which is down here in the cerebellum. This is the way we position the patient. So he's positioned with his, with his head turned to the left. Here's the incision. You can see the incision to get there. And let's go ahead. So you're seeing the incision that we make here. This is getting stuck up. We'll try to, let me see if I can fast forward through here. This is a movie again. I'm going to have to, I'll do it this way. So here's the incision that we make. And now I'm going to, now you'll watch, this is the opening. Um, you can see the, what's called a bovi. This is a, a, uh, a tool that we cut through the, the skin and, and what's called the um, platysma to get down. Ah, sorry guys, I'm struggling here with technology. So this is what's called the sternocleidomastoid, which is now we got the, this is the anatomy. It's, this is the big, you turn your neck, it's that muscle that sticks out. It's the sternocleidomastoid because it goes from the sternum and clavicle to the mastoid process, which is back here, sternocleidomastoid. That's that uh, muscle. And the medial border of that is how we identify the carotid and the, and the, and the jugular vein. And we need to find the common carotid and the vertebral. Here you can see, this is Dr. Ellis, one of my partners, he did this opening. He's gonna put a clip on one of the, one of the uh, branches of the, vein, of the jugular vein so we can retract the jugular vein out of the way. These are hemoclips, now we can cut that. And that really allows us to mobilize the jugular. Here's the common carotid artery here. Here's the uh, external carotid artery, the internal. So now he's gonna put a vessel loop around the common, and now we're gonna go even higher. This is, now we're way at higher mag. This is using the exoscope, which I love. This is called the digastric muscle. It's a kind of a useless muscle that basically blocks our access to our target at the C1, C2 level. Here we're dissecting the guy digastric, cutting through it with a bovi, that's the monopolar. You can see the hypoglossal nerve around the internal carotid artery here. And now we're going to find that C1 lateral mass. And you're, we're looking for it. Here it is under high mag. This, this, this tissue around, it, that is the C1 transverse process. Let's just stop this for a second. That is this bone right here. We're on that bone. And what we're looking at, we're looking, we want to find the vertebral artery in this space. So it's going to be in this position on the right side. We're looking for this bone right here. Once we find that, we know the vert's right there, and then we find C2, and we can find the vertebral artery in between the C1 uh, transverse process or lateral mass and C2, and that's what you're gonna see here. Great anatomy here for the anatomists, vagus nerve. 
hypoglossal nerve, internal carotid artery, external carotid artery, common carotid artery down here, jugular vein. And now we have to find the target uh, vertebral artery. So here we are on that C1 area because now we have to get the muscle out of the way. And now we're dissecting below that process to find the vertebral. Here at even higher mag, here's a Doppler. We're putting the Doppler to find the vertebral. And there it is. That's the vertebral artery right between C1 and C2. So we gently dissect that even higher mag here. Here is in the C1 and C2, we mark it. And it's, it was very deep and the vertebral artery sits and it's in like a cave. So we clip it on both sides, cut it, and elevate it out um, so we can bypass to it. Now we're going to sew in the vein. This is the saphenous vein, and we're going to sew that in. This is what this is. Oh, it's uh, so a seven O proline is the name of that suture. You see us sewing the vein right to that ostia end to end of the vertebral artery. say partial running suture. We often, we can tie sutures either interrupted, meaning one at a time and tie each one, or we can run them kind of back and forth. At this depth, it's much easier to do a running suture just because if you do an interrupted suture, you have to take your, your instruments out every single time. This way we keep the instruments down deep and it's just a little less uh, difficult. Then we're gonna, this is called the, we did the front wall. Now we're on the back wall of that anastomosis. And then once we uh, finish that, now we're down in the neck. So here you can see all of the anatomy. This is the saphenous vein graft here. Let me just pull this back a little bit so you see the markings. Here's the internal carotid. We really want to stay away from that because we, um, we have to um, sew into an artery. In order to sew into it, you have to clip it. To clip it means you cut the blood flow off. You cut the blood flow off, all the area subserved by that artery is now not getting blood flow. So it's much safer to do that coming from the external carotid artery than the internal carotid artery. Much rather, if this didn't work, we'd much rather injure the external carotid artery than the internal carotid artery. So our target is going to be external. There are a couple of questions. Uh, the suture we used interposed there is a 7O proline. The ideal surgical loop size, I don't use loops anymore. I just use the operating exoscope, which is a three-dimensional device. It uses a big screen and 3D glasses. I'll show you a picture of it in a minute. Rather than using a microscope, I think it's better ergonomically for the surgeon and the view is spectacular. Is this a zoomed head cam view? We're using, this is the view the surgeon actually sees through the exoscope. It's not uh, a head cam. Early on, Jason was doing it with loops, but when I took over, I, I used the exoscope exclusively. So you see the anatomy here. And now we're, these are all the branches of the external. This is the superior thyroid arteries. In fact, you're seeing the size now we're gonna clamp the external carotid artery. And we have to make a hole in it. We're gonna use a, a vessel punch. Like with this vessel, we make a slit and then punch a hole out. Now you're seeing the inside of the external carotid artery. We made it even bigger with an, a larger punch. You can see uh, inside, and now we have to match the size of this hole to our, our transplanted vein. Here we're irrigating with heparinized saline. We're going to fish mouth that artery so it fits perfectly. And then we're going to sew it right to the external. Here we're going to run both sides. What we do is we tie the apex. Let's call this six o'clock. We'll call this 12 o'clock. We do this 12 o'clock stitch, the six o'clock stitch, and bring that uh, uh, donor down to the recipient. And now we use one on one side and one on the other to run and attach and tie it to one another. This is a typical vascular surgical technique. Now we're just sewing that proline again to the external carotid artery. Then we, and then we tie it to this end. Now we flip it the other way. And now we're gonna do in the front wall, same, same idea. You know, robots might be able to do this, I think potentially, but it's, I think we're a little far off right now for this particular operation. It doesn't really save anything. 
the current robots are so you can put them inside a chest and not take big openings. You'd still need to be do the same opening to get space. It's possible, but it's not on the frontier yet. Here we're running that stitch and then sewing it to the other side. It's my favorite part, taking the external clamp off. Look at that blood that comes out. So let's, sorry, let's go look at that, look at that again. I screwed that up. Again, I'm just really good at screwing up today. I want you to see that again, how much blood flow is going to the head. So once we finish here, we're gonna take this external clamp off to, to basically make any clot that might've formed there come out. It's called just bleeding out the vessel to block any clot from coming out. And when we take that clamp off, look how much surgery blood comes out of that. It's incredible. Here it goes. Ah! <laughs> and that, that's, that's how much blood is going up that external. You can imagine how much blood you can lose. Um, Vascular surgery could do this operation, yes, uh, but I like to do it, so I'm a neurosurgeon. So then we take the clamp off, it fills the, the donor vein, then I take the clamp off the vertebral, and now I have flow. Doppler here, and I make sure it's open. You can see the size, here's my finger, is the size of this. So now you can really see, here is the bypass from the external carotid artery, vein, to the vertebral. Now what's interesting is here's the, the NOVA study afterwards, you can see the flow went from 49 to 106, from 56 to 98 in the basilar, and now we're getting over 40 cc's on both sides and the posterior cerebral. We can compare them side by side. Here's the angiogram. Now we're seeing the origin of that vein. We're putting a catheter in the external carotid artery. Here's the bypass coming from the external carotid artery here. You can see a faint so much of the flow is going up the bypass, you can barely see the external. Flow is going up the bypass. Here's where it attaches the vertebral end to, end to end, and then onward and upward into the brain case. Now we're seeing the whole basilar filling directly from the vertebral, and you can see the posterior cerebral is filling as well. So there, this is a, an angiogram. This is a diagnostic cerebral angiogram where a catheter is placed in the neck at the right external carotid artery, and then we inject contrast and it fills up the vessels. And you can really see, you can see that external carotid artery here, all branches the, going to the face. Here's the anastomosis of the bypass. This is a valve in the vein that's open. Here's the direction of flow. Here's the vertebral artery. Here's the basilar. Here's the, you can see some atherosclerotic diseases in this posterior cerebral artery. Here's the left PCA or posterior cerebral artery. Here's the right. So that bypass just took over the entire posterior circulation, which was the goal. Here's the setup of the exoscope, which I talked about. Just to show you that um, in real time, and I can show this a little bit better here. Here you see the exoscope. Here's Dr. Ellis sitting, comes over your left shoulder. Here's the, here's the, Here's the uh, neck and the, and the OR where the neck is. Remember how he positioned him with his face turned to the left? This is what's called a Walter arm. It's a robotic arm that's, a that's attached to the OR table. It's a, so it allows to elevate the mandible a little bit and give us exposure. I, I, can, let me, I can blow that up a little bit better now So now because I couldn't describe it on here without the pointer. Let me play it. Here you can see it much better. Um, that's, and you can see the screen there that we used to operate. Someone was asking about, you know, Jason, if you look there, isn't wearing any loops. He's just wearing 3D glasses. And all we're doing is looking at that screen while we're operating. The exoscope is that looks like a Coke can coming off the arm just in front of Jay. You can see it's shining light down on the, on the operative field. And that's the setup. You can see a drill there, which we didn't really need for this case because we were all extracranial. And it really, uh, someone, this is an inspiring case. It's one of my one of the favorite things I think I've done. You can see that angiogram again from the side and from, it's an AP view on the left, anterior posterior view. On the right is a lateral view. You can see that vein graph down below. You can see it filling the vertebral artery beautifully. You can even see flow going from the top of the PCA. This is really interesting. Right here is the PCOM filling the carotid artery. 
So this, this bypass is going up the vert, filling the PCAs, and actually some blood flow even fill, fills his carotid circulation. It's, it's magnificent. And uh, it is amazing. That's why I love my job. Let's face it, this is great stuff. Here you can see a, a NOVA representation, pre on the left, post on the right. You can do the math. There's more blood flow after the bypass, starting down with the right vertebral artery. And that, that's a, a quantitative way of measuring how much blood flow is going to the brain uh, from this bypass graft. And um, this is, uh, uh, is it qualifies as a success. So that's it. I'll stop sharing. I just think that's a great case. It shows off some of the things that we do as neurosurgeons. Uh, yes, vascular surgeon is actually invented by a vascular surgeon in Chicago. Um, and um, it's not done frequently. It's a, it's a rare operation, but certainly a beautiful thing to do. And anytime you can revascularize the head, the brain without opening the skull, you're doing something. Uh, a NOVA study basically is a quantitative measurement. It's not a, a diagnostic angiogram. It's still important to look at the vessels, but a NOVA test is an MRA or an MR angiogram that includes quantitative measurements of the blood flow and the blood vessels. So they're very different and they're used for different things. Uh, being a vascular surgeon, I got amazing. Yes, I'm not the best. There are a lot of great people out there. It is cool. I like to use arteries or veins. Here we use the saphenous vein. Sometimes we can use the radial artery in the arm if, if the patient could tolerate it and also the anterior tibial artery in the leg is a great donor. We've used that for this operation too. All right, questions, comments. How are we doing with time? We're getting close. Uh, well, you know what? You guys inspire me. Um, 300 kids here now. You know, you could be doing a lot of things in the summer. And, um, you know, having all of you here is inspiring for me that we can continue to uh, inspire young people like this. And um, I appreciate this opportunity. I look forward to it. You know, I wish I had more time. I, I, I give Randy again, Dr. D'Amico, a uh, credit for what he's done. And um, he, took, he took this and went with it and really built a great program. And I'm one small part. And um, it's a really a humbling and an honor to talk to you guys, honestly. And uh, thank you for uh, taking the time um, and uh, spending it with me today. It's an honor to teach you all. Hopefully, I can meet you face-to-face uh, -face someday. Uh, I think there's about six minutes left. Yes, Zucker Medi come to Zucker Medical School. It's great. They do rotate with us. We love medical students. Even if you don't go to Zucker, come visit on your medical school rotation. Seeing a lot of thank yous. Something about a cardiovascular surgeon. Yeah, I, I like cardio. I originally thought I wanted to be a heart surgeon actually, but decided not to for a variety of reasons. And uh, I um, think neurosurgery is the way. It's still a great, a great life. Uh, it takes a lot of effort, but it's a great, uh, they do. I see five other questions. The first and foremost quality you see in a buddy neurosurgeon, I'd say honesty and humble and kind. Start there. Will there be a season two? Uh, yes. Uh, there's going to be another season of our series. It's going to not going to be called Lennox Hill. It's going to be called something else, but we will be back in early 2023. We're, we don't have quite as big of a role, which is a good thing. It's a little bit other people are getting involved and give attention to other people, which is always great. So it's not just all about us. Although we are the best, but that's okay. We have to share the wealth and there'll be another season. The chance of getting a residency in the US for international medical student, it's up to you. Uh, I'd say about 10% of neurosurgeons are international. So it's, it's very possible. It's, it's a little harder. In fact, I think the international students that do end up here uh, are, tend to be outstanding because they work that extra hard to get here. Um, Yes, Lenox Hill does accept international students for rotations. Uh, you can email through the email chain and get a hold of us. And we uh, have established internships. We have face-to-face -face internships going on right now in the summer uh, for students. And um, uh, we, they will last uh, through the summer and then on into the, into the regular year. I have used it. I've never used the internal memory already for a bypass of the brain. It's down the chest. It's done primarily for cardiac surgery. Uh, image, image shadowing, we definitely have it, and research, all the above. Applying for face-to-face -face internships is done through the email chain. Uh, you can get email chains. Uh, I'll put my email here. Let 
There's my email. Uh, you can send me an email. I'll forward it over to Flora. I know although Flora is leaving, we will we can organize uh, shadowing during the summer or at other times uh, based on you guys uh, being aggressive and trying to get in here. Have I completely recovered from my accident? Yes. My hands are great. I do have a little bit of, of pins and needles sometimes in my arms. Uh, I feel like I'm better because I've had emotionally I'm better, I think. I think I'm a different person in some ways and feel like I'm able to um, do things up here that I may not have been able to do before. So uh, that's the truth. Uh, high school students, sure, we don't care. Uh, how do, yes, I've treated neurocystic psychosis. Usually it can cause obstructive hydrocephalus or it's inside the brain, we take those things out. Um, the email, I just put in the email chain. Oh, it's the hosts and panelists. I'll put it to everyone, sorry. That was a good, good call there. There you go, sorry about that. Um, thank you, Arupama Pramod. There any requirements over? No, just have to get the never necessary stuff for our hospital, which is vaccines and stuff like that. And you have to be able to pay to live in New York for you know however long you want to stay. That's the biggest problem with the foreign students. The most valuable member of my team. Whoa. Rebecca Wallach, she's our administrator who right now is our MVP. She's incredible. And where she's leaving us and uh, she keeps, she's the glue. We need to replace her and I don't think she's replaceable but she is the one. She is the most valuable member of our team. Was the video of the surgery the real time or fast forwarded? Of real time. Uh, you know, you the, all the sewing was real time. Uh, I might have, I, I uh, scrubbed through a little bit of it so probably looked, might've been faster at times, but most of that was in real time. Uh, Canadians are welcome. International medical grads take part. Yes, we're all welcome, anybody. You can come from the moon if you can get here. You can volunteer for brain turns, reach out to the panelists who are running brain turns. Nurse surgery in 10 years, only gonna get better. My favorite surgical procedure to perform, you saw it. Second year medical student in New York. Is there anything you recommend? I could do at Lenox Hill to build my activity. So you got to come visit for that. Next big advancement of vascular neurosurgery is probably coming in the IR suite or with catheters. And uh, I'm on my last minute because I have to go do some real work. So I appreciate all the questions and all the support. You guys are awesome. Uh, great course. I'm waiting for the next uh, panelist to come. 